All right, thanks everyone for coming. We might have a few latecomers, but we'll go ahead and get started without them. This meeting is also live streamed. So uh, hello to anyone that's out there uh, streaming this live. Uh, this presentation will also be recorded for sharing at a later date. My name is Cassie Drool and I am the Water Resources Outreach Coordinator for Polk County. And I manage a program called the Rain Campaign, which I will uh, give you more information about at the end of this presentation. But a big part of my job is to connect Polk County citizens with all topics related to uh, our watersheds and uh, some unexpected uh, things that uh, we do in our everyday lives that affect uh, our the health of our local watersheds is uh, watering our lawns and watering our yards. And so that's why we have this program available to residents today to talk about how you can uh, use irrigation to uh, make your yard look the way you want it to, but also a way you can do it in a responsible way to uh, not only save water, uh, protect our watersheds, but then save you money in the long run. So we will go through today's agenda. Stand by. Okay. So we're first gonna talk about how irrigation works and then um, water math to program a system. This is something that maybe you're familiar with, but maybe it's something that uh, you didn't take a look at when uh, you had your irrigation installed. Uh, available technology. There's a lot of different uh, ways you can uh, irrigate your yard and uh, for your price point. Simple tools for saving on water, sprinkler system maintenance, water billing, city right-of-way and sprinkler systems, irrigation, water availability, and climate change, and then finally rainscaping. So um, I will introduce our presenters. So we have David Kunkel, is that how I say your name? Kunsel, sorry, uh, who is from, right yeah, <laughs> from TNT Sprinkler. He's here today to talk about um, different types of sprinkler systems that are available out there for you. And then we have David Kroll and Shane Kinsey from the city of Johnston, who are going to talk about how Johnston um, does water billing and some other topics uh, related to that. And then I will speak on the rain campaign. So we will let David Kunzel, take it away first. So let's see, is this coming through okay? Yeah. So uh, just a quick baseline. So does everybody have irrigation at, at their house right now? Yes, yes, generally, okay, good. So if you wanna kick a slide over. Um, I'm gonna try and work from this because I uh, got a couple of things to look at here. It's real busy. My big thing for you guys will be don't try to remember a lot of stuff. I'll try and highlight like maybe five things. If you can remember it, it'll help. So this is actually a kind of an important thing. Um, 
it's 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 hard to sort of editorialize on people I compete against, but what I will say is the three biggest companies in this marketplace, which we're one of, all do water sense designs. So whether it's us or somebody else, you know, people are conversant on that topic in this marketplace. What it means is there's there's some efficiency and some component things that are really important to this, but it really starts with the design. And if you've struggled to get your system to be effective, you know, you feel like, hey, you know, I gotta, I gotta run it more than I think I should. We always have some, some brown zones or we always have a trouble kind of balancing it. I'll give you some tips on things you could do yourself um, to kind of check your design. Uh, this sort of busy Venn diagram looking thing is just, it's, it's called the overlapping head to head uh, principle in putting together irrigation. And when I say head to head, basically you've seen it in your own yard at some point, I would think. But the rotors are the, the things that look like what you see on a golf course, right? They're the, you know, they throw the stream of water out there 20, 30 feet. And what happens is, Good design has two of them pointed at each other and sort of have because it would probably look to the eye like you know, why are they overlap? Why are they putting that better coverage? And I'll use the hose analogy. So if you got a hose in your hand and you put your thumb over it, right? You can get that stream down and you point it like that, what happens? Well, it's pretty tight stream close to where you are and it starts to dissipate as it goes out. So the arc of the water coming out of one of these rotors is exactly like that. So it's tight um, as it's coming out and begins to dissipate as it goes out. And if you have two of them growing in the same kind of arcs, which you get is complementary. So it ends up putting down a consistent amount of water. If you don't do that, then you got problems. Now, where you can kind of check your own uh, designs, and this is where people that try to deliver a value design can cost you a lot of money in the long run. And that is when, when you think about these rotors, and that's where most of the, most of the water's getting sucked up in, in your yards because it does the big turf areas, typically not the small like side of the house or along the sidewalk or things like that. But you, you want to space them. We Our standard is between 20 and 30 feet. These are spec to go out as far as 40 feet. Um, some people will, will, you know, put them at their maximums and that way you can eliminate some heads through the process. Where that gets complicated though is that 40 feet is based on perfect conditions. The wind's not blowing, you know, it's not a super hot day and you're losing a lot to um, evaporation. So th those are things to look at. And I'll talk a little bit about how to audit your system in general, but that's the thing you can look at. And, uh, you know, if, if you struggled for coverage, it's probably because things are spaced out really a little more than they should be. That microclimate piece, Again, back to good design, a water sense design would split, um, let's say you have a, a narrow strip on the side of your house and it's got Eastern exposure. So it doesn't get a lot of heat, you know, sun comes up, goes by it, not much happens over there. That should be by itself in terms of the system design, but a lot of people will take that, run it all the way out along the edge of the driveway out to the sidewalk. And that's a full sun, area all day long. And also in many cases, it's long concrete um, or asphalt and those are heat sinks. And so that's a thing that you have to be a little aware of too, right? Is you're gonna wanna put a little bit more water down on an equivalent basis by the sidewalk, by your driveway, because it's gonna radiate heat back out towards your turf. So if things aren't split up correctly, um, you know, you're going to have to go, well, I'm going to drown this side of the house, but I'll keep this looking good. I'll talk a little bit about smart controllers and the different sensors you can use. There's some pretty cool stuff out there today. Pressure regulated heads. If you live in Johnston, um, 
you want that ideally. Um, Johnson has one of the higher uh, static pressures when they deliver water to you. It's amongst the highest in the metro region. And all this stuff, and don't need to remember this, but it's designed to work at 45 PSI. And generally what's coming out of the water here, I see it at 80, 85, 90 PSI. And back to the question around uh, atomization of the water. So if it's coming in there at 80 PSI and certain heads, and they're expensive, it's what we use, it's what my two main competitors use, these have pressure regulation inside of them. It backs that pressure down to 45 PSI, makes the head work right. You can see these are roughly three times as expensive as their non-pressure regulated competitors. So a way to get a system price down and get the job is to use the other ones, but you'll be a lot happier with these. And we always tell people, you know, the difference between using these kind of components and using the stuff that doesn't save any water, typically five, six hundred dollars on a typical yard system. And it's always hard with irrigation to say, oh, you know, this will pay back in a year or two years, because you never know how much you're going to use it in any given year. But almost inevitably, it'll pay back in two years. And if it's a hot year, it'll pay back in a year easily. And then you have those savings for the lifetime of the system. And then drip irrigation versus using spray heads. Um, drip is the best, right? Um, it's close to 100% efficiency, very little loss. These generally are in the 60 to 70% efficiency range, being, meaning they just work where you're going to lose evap evaporative loss coming out of the water. So drip irrigation is great. The one challenge I'll throw out to people with drip is if you've got an established home, your um, landscape is pretty established, drip irrigation is great. Because you go down, you put it in, you can wrap it around the, the plants and whatnot. Great. But what if you're a creative gardener and you change it every year? Okay, now we're going to have to come out, pull all this stuff up, replace it, pack it down again. And then you get into kind of a maintenance cycle there. Um, but if you're settled, you know what you're doing, it's not a bad way. It, well, it's the best way to go. Um, a lot of commercial sites use drip because they don't change out their landscape much. It's just here's the rows of this and rows of that. And it works really well. And for anybody that's also been, if you've ever been in the Southwest, Arizona, Nevada, they have these little things called bubblers. And you might have seen them. They actually come up out of the ground in this little round thing that just drips a drop of water at a time. Very little loss on that as well. Easy to maintain. They're easy to move around. Uh, it's a pretty good system. Not used that much around here. But... Next slide. All right, so this is where it gets complicated. I think everybody knows we have a high degree of clay in our soil. And clay does not allow water to penetrate very quickly. Okay, So here's the... The rough number here, you can put down, and obviously that's a big variance, right? 0.1 to 0.2 is a huge percentage variance. It's really about the slope, okay? So if you've got a, you know, just a pancake flat area, you're not going to get much runoff. You know, you can saturate it and it can sit there. It's going to evaporate to some degree, but it can sit there and eventually permeate the soil. If you've got a slope side of the yard, most contemporary houses are getting graded where there's pretty good slope off of, for drainage, that's where you get more, more runoff. A lot harder for the, the ground to hold it. So statistically speaking, it's only two months of the year that you're supposed to really need irrigation here, July and August, statistically speaking. We haven't seen that the last few years. And we've been in a drought for what, five or six years? Um, but typical July, August, uh, there's a thing called evapotranspiration. So that's your um, Scrabble word for today. Uh, and that is a combination of how much that grass is going to take away in moisture from the ground. 
And it's affected by a lot of things. It's affected by humidity. It's affected by wind, uh, whether it's cloud cover that day, um, how hot it is on an absolute basis. So those, those things are all drivers on a particular day. And in July, August, it takes away more than that soil can have dumped on it per hour. So what do you do about that? Well, you can do what's on the right, just let it go dormant. Um, I wouldn't be too good at selling this stuff if I had that as the recommendation. This would be a slide where I don't want you to really remember any of this um, other than the big point, which is generally speaking, if you don't have a lot of slope, um, about the best you can do is run a zone. So that would be a section of the yard. Uh, for 15, 20, 25 minutes max. When you start getting much beyond that, you're definitely going to get runoff or it's going to sit. And, you know, all those little math statements there just supports the idea. So next slide. Um, what do you do about it? Um, most people, when you start out the season, will run their system three times a week, typically. Maybe Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, or something like that. So you have generally options to deal with those real high um, demand periods. So adding days instead of adding runtime. So that's the first thing. Because if you want to, if it's running for 20 minutes, you say, ah, it's dying. I'll just turn it up to 40 minutes. You're wasting the water. So, but if you're not running on Wednesdays, um, add Wednesday. I mean, there, you know, there are, that's your progressive way to think about it. It's not, run it longer, just run it more often. The next one's actually kind of an interesting concept because you don't necessarily have to run it more days this way. So cycle and soak just means that you run it for a period of time on, let's say it's Monday, and this runs for 20 minutes. And cycle and soak is actually a, uh, a setting in a lot of the modern uh, controllers. And it just says, okay, and when we're done, come back to that one and run it again. It's essentially just running it multiple cycles on the same day and allowing that, that water to get absorbed. So that's generally most controllers have that now. And it just takes those run times and kind of repeats it over a period of time. And the last one's syringing. And it's interesting because you wouldn't find this in a, irrigation book, but my primary residential designer, um, he thinks it's great. And really all it is, um, every day at three o'clock or a couple times a week at three o'clock, you run your system for a couple of minutes. And if you think about, if you've been again in a desert climate where they have the misters out on the patios and stuff and how that takes the temperature down, he swears by it. He goes, you know, you don't really have to run it more. You just give it a little, a little heat break in the middle of the afternoon. And you'd be surprised how e easily it'll survive because of that. The other thing to think about generally, and this is back to water math. If you do add a day, it probably costs you about 20 bucks to do that. Next slide. All right. So friendly technology. This is our controller at our shop. And unfortunately, it does not do well for my business to have burned up grass. So we have to keep it looking good all year long. But these are some settings that exist. Um, most uh, are the key. What you'll see people in this marketplace use, it'll either be Hunter or Rainbird. It doesn't really matter to some degree. I like the interface and the app that comes with Hunter products. So we use those. Um, this is actually at our shop. But these are settings you can have inside of the system to help it be more efficient. Um, you can say, so, hey, just don't water when it's 65 or less out. I'm not worried about, you know, anything happening there. Oh, you know, uh, when the chance of rain is 70%, just hold off. Don't, don't water that day. It's likely it's going to rain anyway. This is the one that really matters though. Don't water when today's forecasted wind speeds over whatever you want to pick X. That's where you get killed in irrigation is the wind more than anything. 
because once that starts blowing stuff away, you're losing a lot to evaporation at that point. So these things are, are actually automated. You can choose to have them automated. So your Scrabble word of the day was evapotranspiration. That's what these calculate, okay? So in behind this, there's a whole network of weather stations that exist in Des Moines. And there's literally I mean, a thousand more or more. It's just people that have okayed, and I don't really know how they get set up, to be honest with you, but they're, the re, they're allowing their micro information to be read and used by these controllers to calculate what's going on in that specific range so we're in grimes and within a quarter mile of us there's like eight weather stations and you'll find that's really it's kind of like that across the whole metro so these things will just basically dial up time that's where you get into trouble or they'll bring it down the bring it down part works good so um, you got to be a little careful with it uh, but the bringing down part's good, especially as you get like into later August and early September, so it's cooling off. A lot of people don't go out there and just, all right, let me turn this down because uh, we don't need as much. And, you know, this will actually automatically cycle down. It tries to automatically cycle up. I don't recommend it. I actually like your eyes. And then that's where you look at it and go, okay, is this getting stressed? Starting to get a little bit of a sheen to it. Do I need to do something? And that's when you start making the adjustments into the system. Next slide. So this is the coolest thing I will uh, throw out there to people. This is a guy out of Minnesota and it's an, it's an interesting product and you have to think of it as laser printing water. And that's that was what this guy, he actually was uh, like an engineer that did printers. And that's, so he knew about this technology. But if you look closely at the picture, you'll see these are like all multiple streams coming out of one irrigation head there. And it's pretty cool. There's one installed in the metro area that I'm aware of. Uh, we helped them install it. We're a authorized partner or whatever. Um, it's pretty cool and it's really efficient. It, it's, but here's the problem, okay? And this is why we don't push it. It's brand new. The components are extremely expensive. Um, like this particular item, that head that you see there is 10 times the price of this. Um, and that's okay too. I don't really care about that so much, but I do care about, we don't know how long they'll last. Um, They've said they've, they've tested them to last eight years. You seem proud of that. Um, you know, these will last 10, 15 years, and those are $300 a piece. And if we're out there replacing that kind of expensive component, you're going to look at me and go, you sold me a lemon. So we're trying to be a little cautious here until there's a little more data around this. But it's, it's very cool. Um, you know, it's, it's real hard to set up because you actually have to, you have to map each one of those streams as that head moves around. There's an app that you're adjusting how long that stream is. And it takes a while, but super cool. And uh, at some point may become mandatory. <laughs> Next slide. So these are simple things to save on water. Uh, no surprise to anybody, California is driving this. Um, they're creating a lot of standards around irrigation, um, and I think it's good. Um, you know, everything that you install in California has to be at least 65% effective. If you do what the best contractors in this market do, we build systems that are like that. You know, this, this is actually the thing I was telling you about, um, pressure regulation. It saves about 30% uh, on the water. And that's where that payback comes for you using the more expensive products. Um, and there's things called rain, soil, and flow sensors, all really cool things. Um, there are some minor drawbacks, no drawback to a rain sensor, super, 
super simple uh, technology. They work well and they last. Uh, flow sensors are a little more complicated, a little more expensive and sometimes debatable whether it's really needed in a home environment. Where they're really useful and where we use them is in big commercial sites. Where we've got big pipes going in and if something breaks, that's thousands of gallons a minute that is just gushing out of something and that's worth it. Um, soil sensor I'll throw out. Um, there's some new technology with that. Soil sensors have been a bear forever. They sound like a good idea. You probably had at some point in your life a thing you stick in the ground and it tells you whether it's wet or dry or whatever. Problem here is, again, back to your microclimates around your yard. They're not all the same. There's different slopes, different sun, all those things, which means you got to go put a soil sensor in each of those areas. And oh, by the way, each one of them has got to be wired back to the controller. And oh, by the way, most all controllers today don't have enough ports to take all those wires. And so what do you do? Well, somebody came up with a bunch of uh, small uh, Wi-Fi. You can bury them and they got their own Wi-Fi signal. So if anybody wants to uh, try that, I'll put it in your yard for free because I just want to learn something about it. So uh, we're easy to find. Um, I will say one other thing. Um, like most trades, whether you're plumbers or HVAC people and stuff, you know, you go, hey, this costs 300 bucks. I went to Home Depot, it was 50 bucks. Well, if you ever really hold them, they're way different products. And I would just tell you, if you want to do, do some of these things yourself, and there are things that are very DIY friendly, I think. Um, go to one of the wholesalers here in town that supply people like us. I put a car card up here. We buy from a company called Site One. All these companies sell over the counter to normal consumers. Nice thing about Site One is if you're really into your yard, um, they have all the um, kind of commercial grade fertilizers and stuff, and they'll sell that to you as well. It's actually pretty cool. Um, All right, so here's here's kind of the audit tips. And these are simple. These, you know, if you want to take a picture of it or something, you know, you can do that. But um, they're real simple. Um, walk out to your irrigation meter at some point. Find it. Write down what the reading is on it. 24 hours later, go back and check it. If it's moving and your system's not running, something's leaking. Um, and that's the easiest way to know it. The backflow, uh, if people generally know what a backflow is, I hope. Um, if it's outside, check around it for saturation because backflows of all the things that are easy to identify that leak, um, that's a really good one. Um, and you think about it, the design of a backflow is to leak in the event of a incident. So, you know, if you've got components inside that backflow that are failing, it'll start to leak. After you run the system, walk the yard and just look for soft spots. That'll tell you that maybe there's something under my feet right now that's sort of broken. It's got maybe just a crack or something like that. But most importantly, and especially in some of the more mature areas of Johnston, trees kill irrigation systems. They really do. Because I don't really understand botany to the degree maybe I should, but it seems like a tree root can smell water and it can smell it through a pipe even. Uh, because you'll watch those tree roots and they'll just keep going and going until they hit that that line and get the root in there. It's no different. You see pictures of it and you know getting into sewer pipes and things like that. It's just what tree roots do. Um, so just kind of be watchful of that because those are already shaded. And then if you're seeing that it's kind of soggy, you know, that's not, uh, you know, that, that is really kind of, kind of probable. You're going to have a problem in that area at some point. Most all controllers you get today have a test setting. And so you just turn the dial or use your app 
and it'll run every zone for two minutes. And I'm not saying you got to walk all over and look at everything. Just stand there. Watch those heads pop up. Are they sputtering? Is it not really throwing the stream out very well? Oh, that one's broke. Blew the top of it. You got a geyser coming up out of the ground. Um, just a, it's a pretty simple thing to look at. And then, you know, take a flag, take a stick, whatever, put it on there, fix it yourself, call us, uh, you know, either is okay. But it's, it's worth looking at because what you have this time of year, we're going around starting up all these, these systems. And I know it's confusing to a consumer. They look at it and go, you must not have winterized this right. Why is this broken? And the answer to that question is, it's broken well before winter. Uh, most of you guys probably run your systems in the middle of the night, right? I mean, that's the right time to do it. That's when the wind's down, less evaporation. But if it's running at three in the morning and there's not a big wet spot, it's not a area that's all burned up, stuff can be working kind of crappy and you don't know. And that's what you see when you go back through in the spring and you run everything, look at it, adjust things, you find out, well, I don't know when this broke, but it's been broke for a while. And so this is a really quick way just to know, hey, this isn't working right. We got to do something here. And then just sort of rely on the eyes, right? So if you've got these dry spots or you've got these areas that um, just not getting good coverage, what you probably will find is it's fixable with adjustments. So this head here has adjustability from 20 feet out to 40 feet. And you can just keep working until you get that coverage a little more improved. These heads, these are spray heads. And these are the ones that kind of come up and throw out that mist. Well, these get nozzles in them that go from eight feet to 18 feet. And so you can adjust just with a $4 piece, change that out and change the whole pattern of how that water is going down. So it's actually pretty easy to do the adjustments. And more often than not, we find that people that have coverage issues, it's you can take care of it pretty easily with just making adjustments to what's already there. And it's not expensive. Think about the microclimates and run times. We've talked about that. Um, just don't saturate the areas that, you know, might be on the side of the house, not getting a lot of sun, you know, just common sense. Next. All right, maintenance. And I'll take on, there's gonna be other backflow uh, material here, but everybody hates their backflow. Hate how expensive they are. Hate how much I charge you to test it. Um, hate that it's got to be done every year. I'm sympathetic. But there are some things you can do to keep these from becoming a dollar suck. And it's not that complicated. And I will tell you, there's good YouTube videos on how to protect stuff in cold weather. We have some on our website. You can just go there and they're embedded in this how-to section. But the big thing is um, learn how to turn the water off inside your house, okay? And if you can find that device somewhere on the outside of your house, there's going to be a pipe that goes back into your house right around there. And so you go, okay, that's about where this is going to be in my basement. And you'll find it. It's going to have a little handle valve on it to shut it off. Know where that is. If it starts getting really cold out, shut the water off. Because in the event that this cracks and breaks or a pipe bursts, you know, it's, uh, it's a waterfall out there. Learn how to drain it. It's easier than it would seem. Okay. There's these things called test cocks that are on here. You'll see them. Every brand is a little bit different, but they're all the same. They got a little bitty screw, standard screwdriver, and it's like a, how you'd call it, it's kind of like a ball, a rotating ball in there. And all you have to do, once you have the water off, go open that like a quarter of a turn. It uh, releases the pressure inside that backflow and it just dumps the water. One thing I would totally recommend is once it gets to be about mid-October, 
just take a crummy old blanket, a crummy old towel, whatever. Just wrap it around that if you haven't winterized your system yet. Take some duct tape, tape it on. That's good from what we've seen to be three, four, or five degrees of protection for a day or two. Um, and that's usually you will get it warmer in the day, get some cold at night. It's it's, it's a survivable thing. Um, because I'll tell you, when we replace them, it's $500. When a plumber replaces them, it's $1,600 or more. Um, it's a real bite. And uh, it's worth taking some time. Um, you know, the average, I think, you guys probably know more about this than I do. Average uh, first frost around here is usually, I think, the 12th, 15th, somewhere around there in October. Most people would want they want to run their system later into october because they're aerating they're putting down fertilizer doing different things where they want to water it in i'm sympathetic but it's not my fault if it gets cold so know what to do in the event it gets cold um last thing on maintenance really is when you have these systems this stuff's pretty durable i mean it's it's uh you know high impact uh poly whatever and generally will last a real long time unless it, you know, gets hit just right with a mower or a string trimmer or something like that. But um, a lot of ability to do it yourself. And the last thing I want to throw out to you, and the reason I have this controller here is, I'll give you your biggest DIY tip. If you don't have a real modern controller that has like an app that comes with it, doesn't go onto your Wi-Fi network, uh, they're not that expensive. I'd love to sell you one, but God's honest truth is Amazon has great prices on these. They really do. Um, you know, not that much more than I buy them for. And they're not hard to replace. Okay. So every controller, regardless of brand, has a base on it like this. That face open. And the wires go into these slots here all you gotta do is take a picture of it okay you're taking the one off all the wires that go into these slots are a different color and so if the orange one's going into the first slot do that to the new one the red one's in the eighth slot do that to the new one. it's no more complicated than that so if you want to upgrade um it's a do-it-yourself job i'm like i said i'm happy to do it for you, but um, if you're that sort of a person, you know, the only thing I will throw out is um, it can be confusing because most companies make multiple models, mul multiple types, and sometimes picking the right one is a little bit of a challenge. But, you know, if you want to call me and ask me, I'll tell you what you probably want to get. So, um, very doable. Though. So, uh, should I take questions or not? Okay, well, includes my fun for the day. Hi, I'm Shane Kinsey. I'm with the water department and the water and sewer analyst. Um, so they asked me to talk a little bit about um, the irrigation systems and the domestic side, or not the domestic, sorry, irrigation. So. Water billing, it's pretty simple. Um, right now, the rate structure is $10.56 a month to have water. And then it's $6.22 per thousand gallons. One thing nice about Johnston, we do prorate. Um, some communities don't. Um, Johnston, if you use 500, you're gonna pay half that. Um, irrigation water, that's also another component we have if you have an irrigation meter. It's 600, 600 sorry, $6.22 to have a meter every month and that's year round. And then during the um, summer use, when you're using your irrigation, the rate is $9.83 per thousand. How that comes out to is when the council originally set up the irrigation rates, the rate set at 125% of the domestic rate to encourage conservation. Um, you'd be surprised how much people just turn the water on and just let it run. So that was a step um, they started doing the irrigation when they're sewer. The benefit of having irrigation water is you don't pay the sewer rates 
which sewer rates, I should have put that on there, are similar to um, your water, water rates. So you're not, instead of paying double for your just regular domestic water, you're paying 125% instead of double. So that's, that's the savings part of it. Um, so that's a big part of the irrigation. So one of the reasons that the city of Johnston's interested in water usage, I know this graph is kind of busy, um, but this is since 2010 to 2023. One of the things we have up there is our average daily water consumption. So what that is, is how much we use on an average day. Um, skewed a little bit because of the irrigation water. Um, I walk around, so. So this blue line here, on this graph, that is your irrigation use, I'm sorry, average usage. These, this orange bar, that's how much irrigation. So if you see, there's a big gap in Johnston of how much water people use just to irrigate their yards. Um, I like to point out 2012, that was an extremely dry year. We had had, with this line here is how much rain we had during our peak month, um, which is July, August. In 2010 through 2013, we had zero rain fall during those months. So people started irrigating. Um, so if you look here, so in 2012, our average daily consumption was 2.2 million gallons in a day. Um, and just as a reference, the water towers, if you guys know the two elevated towers, there's one by, I call it the Grimes Walmart on the 107th and 70th, there's another one on 100th. Each one of those towers is a million gallons. Um, if you're up on Beaver Drive, there's a standpipe that we just recently painted. That's 2 million gallons in there. So we have 4 million gallons in storage for a day. Um, in 2012, we hit 6.8 million gallons in one day. So that's where I talk about that service availability fee. A lot of times people talk about why should I have to pay a fee in the winter for my irrigation meter. Well, the amount of infrastructure that we have to have in place that helps offset that cost zone. So it doesn't pay a large percentage of it, but it helps kind of control the rates so they're not jumping, trying to chase that. Um. And then over here, what it is, is the max daily ratio. Two is a good number. Um, a lot of the communities are, like I said, 2003, um, 3 million. If you even take, I should have put another what our average use or daily usage in winter is. Um, in 2012, we were using 1.5 million gallons in January. So that tells you the difference between 1.5 on a January day, 6.89 million gallons. So in that year, he was talking about irrigation heads. You'd be surprised at how much those um, will cause a water issue. We get lots of calls in the middle of the night or a water main break. We go out there, what's broken? Sprinkler head in the right of way. And it's just running out there. Um, also, if you, a lot of times he was talking about oversaturating your soils. We get lots of calls to water main break. Someone has watered their grass so much that it's just, they keep running that irrigation system and it's flowing over the curb and it's just running down the gutter. So they're basically putting water, they're spending their money on cleaning the storm sewer. So, so, like I said, this has a lot of information, but what I want to show is there's a lot of irrigation usage in the Des Moines area. I know you said something about clay. I know Johnston has, the west side of town has a lot of clay. Is anybody from the Green Meadows area? The east side has a lot of sand. So sometimes people like to put a lot of water on their grass too because of the sandy soils, but it takes things up. You can go to the next so, and that's what I was talking about. Des Moines, as a general, has high um, turf grass ir irrigation. Um, one of the things about the turf grass irrigation is, he was talking about California, and you know, you get the Southwest, and a lot of people are worried about water quantity. In Iowa, we have a water quality issue. Um, nitrates, and right now, I don't know if anybody has heard about the Central Iowa Water Works. Um, it's a regionalization of the treatment. So fluor treatment plant can treat up to 100 uh, 
I want to say, I'm going off the top of my head. I want to say 115 million gallons in a day is what Des Moines Waterworks as a system, which will be Central Iowa Waterworks, can kind of treat in a day. And that's dependent on, you know, having the supply of water available. Um, so their peaks were around 90 million gallons in a day. So they were getting to the point where in the summer, the raccoon, I guess, if you've seen the Raccoon River, which is our primary source of water, you can see a lot of sandbars and everything. So they're watching that amount of water. Go ahead and change the next slide. So what they've implemented is a wise water um, program. And one of the reasons, if you see here, is it says, you know, even odd, even odd, even odd, um, but no watering on Monday. Traditionally, most people on the, the old school systems, they would start their systems on Monday and everybody watered on Monday. Well, we were having such a peak that we took the rest of the week to trying to recuperate from the Monday irrigations. Um, we've had this for the last couple of years and this has actually helped out tremendously. And just, I like your cycle from a water production perspective because that keeps with the, if you're in a cycle multiple days instead of more, more days during the week, not sorry, multiple times during the day instead of multiple days during the week, that helps us on a production side. So, and that, that makes huge difference for us. Um, where I was showing about water production or that 6.8 million, the last few years, we've been about five and a half million is our peak day. And that's just because that water usage has been spread out. We're selling more water, but we're not having that peak day, which actually will help your rates because we don't have to have storage to meet that peak demand. Um, so this is a, a big, big thing that we're really trying to encourage here is this even odd, um, no watering on Mondays. That, that helps quite a bit. Go ahead and change. Um, I also talked about, we talked about backflows. A lot of people go, why do I need a backflow? I like to point this out here. Um, backflows, what they're really doing is they tell you that backflows are supposed to protect the public from contaminants. Another way to look at it is you're protecting yourself from contaminants. A lot of people, it's an expense. You know, I have one myself. It's Every year I sit there and go, oh, I got to pay for it to get this started up again and test it because it's not, not cheap. It's around $100, I always tell people, roughly, um, to get those tested in. Um, but it is a state require. It's a state and federal requirement uh, for communities over, I want to say, 15,000 population has to have a backflow program. Um, but what this is is how your system set up is all the water comes into your house any chemicals or, you know, dog droppings, it's more likely if you have a backflow event. What a backflow event is, is the water gets drawn back into the water system. And then when everything repressurizes, it'll just push it into your houses. Things that cause that are like water main breaks, firefighting, like a fire department's out doing something or just pressure fluctuations. So, but I like where you were pointing at. I'll, like I said, I've had my system for nine years now. I know some guys that complain about, oh, I have to get my backflow fixed every year. I've had it replaced multiple times. I've had mine nine years, and I've never had to have it. Wrapping it, that's a great thing. Um, just this style is a little bit harder. The style that he had up there was um, the Fepco Wilkins. That one you can actually pull. That's what I have. I actually pull that device out every winter. A couple screws, the thing, you know, they winterize it. I take it inside and it sits inside. So I don't have any problems with that. Um, so that's just kind of tricks I do. And like you said, covering it when you know the winter is coming, crack those ball valves if you think it's gonna get cold because another advantage of that ball valve, if there is moisture in there, gives the water somewhere to kind of go to. If you keep the system all closed, when the water freezes and expands, you're gonna break something. Um, that's something. And oh, here's another story of backflows. It's always good to have some, a, 
a trusted company do your blow offs for your um, irrigation systems. We have, we've had it happen several times. Some new company comes in, they turn it off at the backflow outside the house, they hook the air compressor on, blow everything out. And then November, we're getting tons of calls in the winter or in the, like when it gets dark, water's just flowing out of the side of the house because they winterized the irrigation system, but they didn't turn the water off from the house outside. Um, or if you do have an issue in the winter, good to know where your shutoff valves are. I had a neighbor one time, uh, she, she's moved, but she sat there. I was shoveling this driveway uh, in January. All of a sudden I hear water running and I freaked out. And I'm like, oh no. And it was on the side of the house that my plumbing is on, the irrigation system. I run over there, her house, it's just blowing out of the side of the house because she just turned it off and thought she didn't need to inter winterize it. We do live in Iowa, you gotta winterize them. <laughs> Go ahead and change the slide. Um, so Dave, we're gonna kind of pass it off to Dave a little bit here on the right away. One of the things that from a public works perspective, we do allow um, irrigation systems in the right away, but you have to have what's called a right away permit. Um, he'll give a little bit more details on that. Um, did have one more thing to jump in before because I had it on my notes that I didn't look at while I was talking. Um, so one of the things of why should you use wa wise water use to help with your rates is I was talking about the um, water quality issues that we have, like the runoff and like the DNR regulations, Department of Natural Resource regulations is eight milligrams per liter of nitrates for your um, nitrates in the drinking water coming from runoff from fertilizers from the farms, um, people not picking up after their dogs. For Des Moines Water Works to run that facility, they have a nitrate removal facility down at the fluor plant, $10,000 a day to run that facility. So sometimes more what they're running into is we have plenty of domestic water that irrigation water. So if you can find ways to make your systems more efficient, kind of shave those numbers, that helps them from using that system. Well, that, that's a big takeoff that I wanted to point out. So I'll hand it over to you, Dave. All right, so Shane kind of jumped right in there to the right away discussion. Um, let's see, I've worked for the city of Johnson for almost 18 years now. And before that I worked for the city of Ames. And so I'm pretty well versed in public works, uh, both water, sewer, and storm sewer systems and how they operate. So it doesn't matter where you're at in the Midwest, but you've probably dealt with questions about what is the right-of-way? What does it mean to me? So the right-of-way, or some people call it the parking, is basically the land that the city owns. In Johnston, it's roughly one foot behind the sidewalk towards your house, across the street to the opposite side, to about one foot behind the back of curb on the opposite side of the street. So that is land that the city owns, but due to Iowa's state law, you get the pleasure of maintaining and mowing. And I always thought that's funny. And I've had some people come talk to me and ask me, you know, Mr. Kroll, why is that like that? And I said, well, number one, it's a state law, but somebody phrased it. If we had to equip city forces to mow that, like we do our parks, somebody back figured the, the tax rate for that. And our tax levy would be about three times as high as it is right now. If we had to staff and maintain the equipment to mow all that ground. So that's why the state law exists. It actually isn't a bad deal when you look at it if you don't want your tax rate to go up. But anyway, so when you put irrigation systems in the right of way, it's not the biggest deal in the world. You think, oh, it's just a few sprinkler heads, right? Well, sometimes that's the case, but sometimes that's not the case. So we say that, yes, we will permit you to put sprinkler heads in the right of way. Don't panic if your sprinkler heads are in the right of way now. Before you bought your house, they were there. It's not a big deal. But we would encourage you to think about that if you're getting a new sprinkler system installed, because later on there could be costs associated with that, you know, if they break or get hit. It would be like putting your sprinkler heads in your neighbor's lawn and then having a, a crotchy neighbor that says, why'd you put your sprinkler heads on my property, right? So that's something to consider. Next slide, please. Okay, so again, 
back to what exactly is the right of way. So I, as I mentioned before, right of way is actually the area from the one side of the sidewalk, about a foot behind the sidewalk towards your house, all the way across to one foot uh, behind the sidewalk on the other side. And the reason that's there is obviously for the streets and the paving, um, the sidewalk, the area, the parking between the sidewalk and the street is because we live in the Midwest, it's for uh, snow storage for the winter. So lately we haven't had too bad of winters, but there's been some winters in my tenure here where we've used up all that snow storage and then a little bit more. And then also cul-de-sacs present a unique problem here in Iowa because where do you put all that snow? And some of it inevitably, despite the best plow drivers that we have and the most courteous, it always ends up in your driveway regardless. So it's just a fact of life. We live in Iowa, we have winters, we have to deal with the snow. The other thing that the right of way is good for is that's where we put all our utilities, your sanitary sewer service, your water mains, storm sewer, right? And then also the lesser known stuff, Mid-American Energy, street lights, um, communications. So uh, next slide, please. So also let's talk a little bit about the difference between like the right of way and an easement. So where it differs is the right of way is city owned property, just like you own your property, right? An easement is where somebody in the chain of custody of that piece of property has given license or rights to somebody else. So say you and your neighbor don't use the side of your property, but you decide that, hey, it's a good idea to you know, have a driveway to go back to the back 40 of both our properties, right? So you can set up what they call an ingress egress easement that allows both of you access to that. And then you define in that easement some terms like, hey, when we need to put gravel on that drive, we'll split it 50-50, right? We'll go half seas on it. So easements, and they can be lots of different types of easements. There can be blanket easements that cover whole broad areas, or they can just be very specific strip easements that cover like one utility or multiple utilities. Next slide, please. Okay, so again, I mentioned there's lots of different types of easements. One of the most common ones we see is what we call a PUE, public utility easement. So that'll be like where Mid-American Energy would put the power lines. That'll be where uh, communications, you know, Maubel, CenturyLink, Quest, Metronet, can they, they can put their utilities in there. It's kind of like a, a free-for-all with some guidelines, right? So we can kind of regulate, tell them, no, we want you to put your stuff here, but we have to let them put it because it's for the greater good of everybody, right? So that's one type, public utility easement or a PUE. Then we have more specific easements for like water mains or sewer or storm sewer that we get into too. So back when I got out of college, it usually wasn't as detailed described as what comes now. So when a property is platted now, we actually have the easement documents that go with it that spell out the terms. So over here to the right, I know the text is really small, but you know, if I could read it, it basically says, you know, in consideration of a dollar, me, Joe property owner, grants the city of Johnson the right to put their storm sewer under my ground in this area, right? And easements run with the land. So it doesn't matter if you sell your property, the next guy, they get the easement. It's very hard to do away with an easement. It's not impossible, but it's very hard. So easements run with the land. That means forever. And you can see the easements if you ever look at your abstract, if you ever want some good bedtime reading, go through your abstract page by page and read through all the stuff that's in there. It's kind of interesting. So the other thing in the terms, they, they, they spell out, like this one happens to be for a sanitary sewer, I believe. Yeah, uh, no, this is storm sewer anyway, but it talks about the uh, erection of structures, you know, the grantor and successors and assigns shall not erect any structure, building, fence over within the easement area without obtaining the prior written permission of the city or the city's agent, right? So usually there's a document like this that spells out exactly what you, the homeowner, can or can't do. In the case, bringing it back to what we're talking about here today, sprinklers and sprinkler systems, it's not a make it or break it deal, but just realize that if you put your sprinkler system in the right of way or in an easement, maybe at some point in time, Mid American Energy has to come fix a line that powers your house. They might cut your head. It's not the end of the world. 
sometimes if you get a good contractor, they might fix it for you. Or you might work with somebody like Dave to come fix it. He told me earlier that it doesn't cost that much, right, Dave, to fix, fix a broken head. Sometimes it's cheaper just to say, hey, guys, I didn't know you had this emergency. Just go ahead and cut my heads. I'll shut off the system in the house. Going back to knowing where your shutoffs are. And I'll call my guy and he'll come out and fix it, right? Um, next slide, please. So just to give you an idea, this is kind of in a general sense how deep the utilities are. So that right away and those easements can be very crowded, a lot more crowded than you think. So for instance, phone cable, anywhere from zero inches deep, you've probably all seen it, where there's been a cable line strung across your neighbor's driveway for two years, wondering why it goes to the other neighbor's house. Sometimes those subcontractors don't get back out to bury their stuff, right? So phone cable and communications cable is the like the first regime. That stuff is usually pretty close to the surface. Easily hit if you're digging up control lines for sprinklers or whatever, right? And then next lowest, you know, you get... You can have like a water service to your house. That's anywhere from four feet to seven feet deep. As you start to get bigger stuff, the sanitary sewers obviously is deeper. Um, but, you know, irrigation heads, what do you say, Dave? Zero to 12 inches tops. But you cannot forget, you'll have your, your one-inch sprinkler runs, but you're also going to have control wires. I know I was participating, participating in a volunteer effort with the schools, and we were putting in this beautiful rain garden. <laughs> bunch of volunteers and we were digging out this rain garden basin and we knew where the sprinkler heads were from the school's irrigation or the school's maintenance guy but we ran into the bundle of control wires and so there's a control wires that about 20 of them that we just sliced right through and they weren't on the map all the runs were but the control wires weren't so be thinking of that too it doesn't take too much to put a shovel through a little 16 gauge wire so okay um Sanitary sewer mains, that's really deep, six feet to 12 feet deep. You're probably not going to worry about that. Water mains, again, the big stuff that the city runs, six, eight inch mains or bigger, four feet at the shallowest to probably 10, 10 12 feet deep. And this is all really round general numbers. Uh, electricity and mid American gas, you know, anywhere 18 to 36 inches deep. Now, I'm saying all this with the caveat is I've seen all these utilities not where they're supposed to be at depths either completely not where they should be or a lot deeper. So you kind of got to, every, every situation is individual. Next slide, please. All right, so that brings us to call before you dig. How did I learn this? Because I cut my phone line at home twice, not even six inches down. Didn't even know it was there. I thought, well, how can I cut my phone line here when I got another phone line over here? My house had two separate drops different sides of the house over time. My house was built in 67. Apparently the guy used to work for the phone company. We had two separate lines coming in, cut one. They fired up the other one. Then I cut it. And I was like, well, wait a minute, what's going on? So uh, always, always, always call before you dig. You think, well, I'm just planting a tree. I'm just, I'm just digging some hostas in, right? Guess what? You might cut your own phone line and guess what? They make you pay for it. And it's over a hundred bucks. So, uh, one thing that's kind of cool, you, you've probably all seen this, right? You, you see the, the right away littered with flags, all different colors, and you're wondering what the heck's going on there, right? It's not always our project, but those flags are usually color-coded. And so this is kind of a general schema. So white flags usually indicate the area of excavation, right, in totality. Uh, red flags are electricity. Yellow is gas, right? Green is usually sewer and sometimes storm sewer. In Johnston, we use what, brown? Green for both, okay. Um, blue is usually always water. But anyway, this is kind of like a national standard. Most people abide by it pretty closely. So now you kind of know what uh, some of the flags mean. Okay, next slide, please. So, okay, back to irrigation. Your irrigation is your property. Whether it exists on our right away or in somebody's easement, it's your system. So guess what happens when I'm, uh, I'm with J&K excavating and I'm doing a Johnson water main project and we have to go through the parking or the right-of-way in front of your house. Our excavator J&K calls Iowa One call. They come out, mark the utilities. The city does not locate your sprinkler system. 
Who do you think is supposed to locate the sprinkler system? <laughs> exactly. So there's two things. You ultimately need to locate your sprinkler system. But chances are you don't know where the runs are, and neither does he. So that doesn't do you any good if you've got an existing sprinkler system. But, you know, in a perfect world, if you're a new place, you're getting a new install, there's, you're spending thousands of dollars with them. Ask them for a shop drawing. Where are my runs? Where are my heads? I had to do this years ago for the city of Johnston, some of our irrigation. And I'll tell you a really quick story about that. We had beautiful irrigation up at the library. And for the first 10 years from 2000 to like 2010, and then we were having maintenance issues it, big time with that, right? So we decided to shut it off. Guess what happens when you shut off a sprinkler system? All the grass and all the beautiful tulip trees die because they're classically conditioned to go in for water at the same time of the day. It's expected that it's going to be there. You shut off your sprinkler system and guess what? All those trees. I can't remember the exact number, but I know it was more than 10, but probably less than uh, 30 that we actually had to replace because the trees died because the roots were this big because they always had water anytime they needed it expectedly, right? So think about that too. I was talking to my buddy in, uh, over in Omaha last week, and they've run a lot of irrigation out there. And he says they see it all the time. People are just tired of paying the bill or whatever. They're in the drought. Uh, the grass is going to die anyway. I'll just shut it off. The grass's roots is only this long. So your grass isn't, isn't conditioned to handle all this weather. So sometimes we make our bed. <laughs> All right, next slide, please. All right, so permits, irrigation permits. Uh, Shane talked about this a little bit, right? So yes, we do require permits. If you're a homeowner installing your own system, we don't really require, I don't think there's a fee, but we just want you to, we want to know who's doing what in the right of way, right? Because we always get calls. So-and-so is digging in my yard. But sometimes it's just a communication tool. We can say, oh, that's an American injury. That's Metronet or that's, you know, that's us. We're we're fixing a, a water line, right? So between Iowa One call and these right-of-way permits, it allows us to keep track of who's doing what, where, and when, right? So for the homeowner, I don't believe there's a fee. Now, if you're a contractor, like if you have Dave and TNT come in, I think we charge them 50 bucks, I think. So that's kind of that. Next slide, please. I think that's going to kind of wrap it up for me. I think... Uh, Cassie wants to talk really briefly about the rainscaping, which, and she'll tell you a little bit about the partnership there. And when we get into specifics, I can ad lib a little bit about some of the programs we have here in Johnston. All right, thank you. I know we're at time, so I'll keep this pretty brief, but um, I wanted to uh, talk a little bit about the rain campaign and how it, it connects to what we've been talking about with uh, irrigation and being responsible about it. So um, like Shane had mentioned, um, a lot of times if you are not using your irrigation system to the most optimum way you could, you are using too much water for one, and you might be watering your sidewalk. You might be watering areas of your yard that maybe don't need that much water. And what happens is whatever water doesn't get soaked into your yard is going to leave your property. And that's when it turns into what we call polluted stormwater runoff. And when it starts to um, hit those impervious surfaces, like paved surfaces, it will start to make its way to the nearest storm sewer, but along the way, it will pick up pollutants from the road. So leaky car fluids. Um, if you have um, excess fertilizer on your yards, it will pick that up along with uh, dog poop that dissolves and it will all go straight to the storm sewer and to the nearest body of water untreated. So being responsible about how you irrigate your yards can um, help uh, the health of our watersheds, not only here, but everywhere downstream to the Gulf of Mexico. And some other options you have to help your water, act, your, your yard act more like a sponge and soak up that water is to do what we call rainscaping. And there's different ways that you can do landscaping with a purpose. So for soil and water health. And I brought some brochures that are on uh, the table on the side over here. If you're interested in learning more about these practices, I'm going to be really brief, but um, you can harvest rain coming from your roof in a rain barrel and use that for um, watering your garden, for your plants, for um, filling your bird bath or giving your dog a bath. So there's ways to take that water that may potentially leave your property and hold on to it for use uh, during drier days. 
You can also um, enhance your existing lawn with soil quality restoration, which is a deep tine aerator system. You're pulling four to six inch plugs out of your lawn and then top dressing that with a layer of compost and overseeding. And over time, that uh, soil uh, will absorb that uh, or the compost will intermix with the soil within a couple of weeks and encourage your lawn to grow deeper roots because it's getting a lot of good organic material from that compost. And deeper roots in plants means better uh, soil absorption, just like Dave was mentioning how turf grass only has a couple inches normally of roots. So even more ways that you can uh, absorb more water is planting Iowa native prairie plants in your yard. And you can do this either in a pocket prairie or a prairie strip along your property, like maybe in the back at the bottom of a hill, or you can do it in an ornamental rain garden. So you can arrange them in little clusters that look very similar to other flower beds that you see on people's properties and put edging around them. And it can be a really great um, feature for your yard. And those roots can get several feet deep, three to 14 feet deep. And that's uh, big and compared to your turf roots. And so that just uh, soaks up tons of stormwater. So if you have areas of your yard that you aren't using um, and you can uh, sacrifice a little bit of your turf for some of these rainscaping practices or install a rain barrel, that's just an added benefit to helping keep our watersheds healthy. And uh, like I said, I have information about it here at Brochures. I also have um, some rain gauges available in this box up front for anyone that would like one. And then don't forget to take a rain sensor from Dave at TNT as well. So uh, at this point, we will go ahead and take questions for any of us. So I really wanna thank everyone again uh, for coming in person and for tuning in online today. Are there any questions? None at this time. Okay. Well, like I said it before, thank you again so much for coming. Feel free to take some free stuff, some literature. And um, if you have any questions um, after this that you didn't get answered, uh, feel free to reach out to Johnston or uh, take a business card from me or from Dave, and we will make sure to find the answer for you.